Okay, so it is thicker, but it's not incredibly thick. Next, it is a selectively permeable membrane. This is not true. Actually, please take note, the cell membrane is fully permeable. That means to say, that actually water can just pass through it, as and when it pleases. Nothing is stopping it. In fact, the cell wall is more like, if you go to a construction site, you see those metal scaffolding, it provides structure, but it is fully permeable. People can walk in and out, liquids can flow in and out. It is fully permeable. It is almost like if you wear a straw hat. The straw hat, uh, she lost a lot of holes. Uh, things can go through. You wear that on a rainy day, you like to just pass. What you need is an umbrella. Next C, it is made up of cellulose. This is correct. Cellulose is kind of like a fiber you find in your vegetables. That's the thing you cannot digest. But there's one animal that, there are a lot of animals that can digest it, herbivores. So herbivores can digest cellulose. Kind of like cows, sheep, horses, they can digest cellulose, but not you. So for yourself, you like it to be up. Last one, it supports the cell and gives it a regular shape. This is true. So B is the only untrue statement. Okay? Show can. Show. Okay. Next we go to question six. Question six shows you four types of cells. They ask you which cell is specialized in carrying water out of a plant stem. So here we have four types of cells. What is each type of cell? Perhaps you want to label what each one is. So we look at A, B, C, and D. A is a cell called the xylem. Did you learn this before in primary school? Okay, the dry is nodding ahead. Okay. Okay. If you learned this in primary school before, likely you learned it under the topic of transport in class. B, you want to make a guess what this is? You learned this before? Okay, yeah, it is a red blood cell. C, I think you learned this in primary school before also. It's a root hair cell. D, this one maybe you've not learned before. Ah, it's not an egg, uh, but who gets because it's round? This is a white blood cell. What is the function? The function is for the immune system. Okay, we look at number one, 
Number one is showing a collection of various different things. We have brain, the spinal cord, we have nerves. They are all different, different organs. So together, they comprise one organ system. You know what system this is? This system is the nervous system.
So with reference to 10.1 and 10.2, what is 10.1? 10.1 is referring to this diagram above, this plant cell. So they ask me to compare the plant cell with this bacterial cell. They want you to identify two similar features. What are two similar features between these two cells? Yeah. Or just one feature will do. They both have cell walls. Okay, they both have cell wall. Anything else we can compare? Bigger? Between this cell and the one above. Similarity. Cell membrane, okay? So we take Shuya as a reference point, cell membrane, cell wall. These two are possible answers. There are others, some we did not label. So for example, if you want to put cytoplasm, that's fine also. So let's have a look. So I see cell wall, that's Shuya's point. Reagan's point is cell membrane. Cytoplasm is also acceptable. Both have vacuoles. Although the vacuoles are slightly different. One is small, one is big central one. So you have these four similarities you can work with. And then you want some differences. Yes? How about the nucleoid? Nucleoid, is it? Um, is you talking about it as a similarity or difference? Okay, so if you see the word nucleoid, it is not the same as a nucleus. Okay? Um, if I compare what's the difference between a nucleus and a nucleus, a nucleus is kind of like a naked nucleus. All you find is the DNA is floating around, but it doesn't have a membrane to enclose it. Okay? So that's what a nucleus is. A nucleus is just a region where you find the DNA. Nucleus is where you find the DNA and it's enclosed inside a membrane. And that is a nucleus. Membrane down organelle. Okay? So it's not a similarity, but however we could use that as a difference. Okay, so I think Hybrid has brought up one of the differences. So if you look at a plant cell versus a bacterial cell, plant cell has a large nucleus. Whereas a bacterial cell has a nucleoid. So that's difference number one. Any other differences that you notice? Okay, one has chloroplast, one doesn't have. Okay, one has chloroplast, one doesn't have chloroplast. I think I will accept the answer. Anyone else? Has anything else? Adopt this practice as your writing. 
if you do not, if you did not phrase it this way, will you try to rephrase it? See if you can cancel out some of your wordings. Replace it with while. Other words you can use to compare other than while is one cell has this, but the other one has another thing. One of the cells has this, however, the other cell has another. Okay? Then it makes the comparison a bit clearer. Which one has this, which one has that? Other than that, only one comparison per sentence. What do I mean by that? For example, I notice some students, when comparing two different cells, they will write this. So this is a no-no. Uh. If you wrote it this way, then I would like you to do your correction. So you cannot do this. Don't write tan cells have, and you write large nucleus and large central vacuole, while bacterial cell has, and then you go on to describe what bacterial cell has. <coughs> Notice what I'm doing here is that I'm combining a lot of points together in one whole sentence. But don't do this because it makes it very difficult for the teacher to search for all your comparisons. And um, from my experience, sometimes you miss it up. Then you will lose marks along the way. Yeah? Also, this is not really a comparison. Now you are telling me what's the characteristics of plant cell, and then you tell me what's the characteristic of bacterial cell. You're not comparing character to character. Okay? So please have a look at your answers, how you phrase it.
for you to do some corrections. division of labor is necessary in a multi-set law of wisdom. It goes back to what we were discussing last week. Why don't we have just one cell doing everything inside our body? Why aren't we a single cell even? So why should we divide the job? Why do we split the job within a body? So two reasons. Number one, so that we can carry out many functions at the same time. So that's the first point. The second point allows the functions to be carried out more efficiently. <coughs> and then the last one, the last one is quite long, it's almost an asking right essay. Uh, 
your dot. Okay. You also find on your textbook, page 42, 43, and 44, they have a lot of long paragraphs. For example, 10.2.1 says discovery of the electron, 10.2.2 discovery of the positive nucleus, and so on and so forth. All these paragraphs do not need you to memorize them word for word. I would like you to appreciate what each segment is about, which you are going to summarize in the video about to watch. So today we start off a new chapter. This chapter has to do with the foundation of chemistry. When we look at biology, what is the basic unit of life when we look at biology? Cells, which is the topic we just came from. We look at cells, this is the basic unit of life. We know that cells are made up of many different organelles, like your nucleus, the mitochondria, so on and so forth. But some students have asked, what are these organelles, mitochondria, what are they made up of? If I zoom even closer, what are they made up of? So I'm going to zoom a little bit more. If we have cells, we find cells are made up of organelles. But what are organelles made up of? Organelles are made up of these things called biomolecules. Okay. But if I zoom in a little bit more, what are biomolecules made up of? They are made up eventually of all the chemistry of it. Oh, atoms. Yeah, okay, and if you go a little bit more into atoms, well, that is out of our scope. So, so out of my scope. I'm not an expert in this field. But the beauty of atoms is that atoms, on one hand, can be the building blocks of life. Atoms can also be the building blocks of non-living things. So for example, things like your materials, your cable, the floor, the air surrounding us, those are non-living. Yet, that's also what atoms are made up of. So, that's what I find quite amazing about atoms. At the end of the day, atoms are the foundation of all living and non-living things. And actually, that's why I like biology. Because if you look at the core of it, the big question is, how in the world do the same atoms that make up non-living things give life? That is a fundamental question biologists are still trying to figure out. And that's why I enjoy biology as a subject. Because if you look at chemistry and physics actually, we are looking at the laws that govern these atoms. Why would the atoms be subject to gravity and for physics? Why do some atoms able to react with each other and some can't? Chemistry. But it doesn't explain why atoms at the end of the day, when you fill them up, can give rise to life. Biology, that's why I love biology a lot. Okay, sorry, I'm selling biology, but I should be selling all three sciences. So, that's why we're gonna, this, that's why atoms as a topic is a very fundamental topic. It leads into all sciences. And as we've learned that, actually when we look at science, it's not a rocky, it's not a very smooth road. So we might figure out what cells are, what cells are made up of, all the various components, it took many, many, many years. The history of atoms is even more complicated. The atoms we know of today, not quite what was taught a long time ago in the classrooms. So we're going to start off today's lesson by looking at the 2,400 year old history of the search of what atoms were. What we knew of atoms back then, totally not what we know of today. And I think if we go back in time and you see the lesson, it, it will seem quite simple. Yeah, understanding. But again, it, we are always limited by the tools we have. And so sometimes students ask me, let's say if we go 2,400 years in the future, our understanding of atoms will be different. I'm quite confident to say it will be different based on what we know in the future. So for now, I'd like you to take note of the history, take note of all the scientists that have been involved in this 2,400 year discovery. And then we'll slowly uncover the various different models along the years. Although they are 
have separated over 2,400 years of history, each of them contributed to answering the eternal question. What is stuff made of? It was around 440 BCE that Democritus first proposed that everything in the world was made up of tiny particles surrounded by empty space. And he even speculated that they vary in size and shape depending on the substance they compose. He called these particles atomos, Greek for indivisible. His ideas were opposed by the more popular philosophers of his day. Aristotle, for instance, disagreed completely, stating instead that matter was made of four elements, earth, wind, water, and fire. And most later scientists followed suit. Atoms would remain all but forgotten until 1808, when a Quaker teacher named John Dalton sought to challenge Aristotelian theory. Whereas Democritus's atomism had been purely theoretical, Dalton showed that common substances always broke down into the same elements in the same proportions. He concluded that the various compounds were combinations of atoms of different elements, each of a particular size and mass that could neither be created nor destroyed. Though he received many honors for his work, as a Quaker, Dalton lived modestly until the end of his days. Atomic theory was now accepted by the scientific community, but the next major advancement would not come until nearly a century later, with the physicist J.J. Thompson's 1897 discovery of the electron. In what we might call the chocolate chip cookie model of the atom, he showed atoms as uniformly packed spheres of positive matter, filled with negatively charged electrons. Thompson won a Nobel Prize in 1906 for his electron discovery, but his model of the atom didn't stick around long. This was because he happened to have some pretty smart students, including a certain Ernest Rutherford, who would become known as the father of the nuclear age. While studying the effects of X-rays on gases, Rutherford decided to investigate atoms more closely by shooting small, positively charged alpha particles at a sheet of gold foil. Under Thompson's model, the atom's thinly dispersed positive charge would not be enough to deflect the particles in any one place. The effect would have been like a bunch of tennis balls punching through a thin paper screen. But while most of the particles did pass through, some bounced right back, suggesting that the foil was more like a thick net with a very large mesh. Rutherford concluded that atoms consisted largely of empty space with just a few electrons, while most of the mass was concentrated in the center, which he termed the nucleus. The alpha particles passed through the gaps, but bounced back from the dense, positively charged nucleus. But the atomic theory wasn't complete just yet. In 1913, another of Thompson's students by the name of Niels Bohr expanded on Rutherford's nuclear model. Drawing on earlier work by Max Planck and Albert Einstein, he stipulated that electrons orbit the nucleus at fixed energies and distances, able to jump from one level to another, but not to exist in the space between. Bohr's planetary model took center stage, but soon it too encountered some complications. Experiments have shown that rather than simply being discrete particles, electrons simultaneously behaved like waves not being confined to a particular point in space. And in formulating his famous uncertainty principle, Werner Heisenberg showed it was impossible to determine both the exact position and speed of electrons as they moved around an atom. The idea that electrons cannot be pinpointed but exist within a range of possible locations gave rise to the current quantum model of the atom. A fascinating theory with a whole new set of complexities whose implications have yet to be fully grasped. Even though our understanding of atoms keeps changing, the basic fact of atoms remains. So let's celebrate the triumph of atomic theory with some fireworks. As electrons circling an atom shift between energy levels, they absorb or release energy in the form of specific wavelengths of light, resulting in all the marvelous colors we see. And we can imagine Democritus watching from somewhere, satisfied that over two millennia later, he turned out to have been right all along. Okay, so if we look at the history of the atom, long time ago, a big question always 
name before it's minus. How small can things go? If I were to cut you up, how small will you go? What's the smallest unit you can ever reach? At least to scientists back then, they accepted that at the end of the day, if I were to chop everyone up into the smallest units, eventually you'll reach a point where you cannot chop anymore. They could not reach that point, they could not see that point, but that was their conclusion. It was very likely that we will reach a point where you cannot cut anymore. And that was the first idea of the atom. But no one had any idea what it looked like. And so, the very first model looked kind of just like a circle. You know, that's probably what the smallest unit looks like. Just a small little particle. But it just went by many different experiments, we discovered that this is likely not the case. Along the way, we discovered that there are likely smaller particles than atoms that can be found inside the atom. But how it's arranged differed in its model over the years. Because people could not see these things, they can only postulate and predict. The very first idea of an atom <coughs> looks something like that. They believe that the atom consists of a particle that is positively charged. Okay, all the plus signs I'm writing up means that it's positively charged. But with some negatively charged particles embedded inside, like a cookie. So page 45, there's some space for you to do all this. this discovery with the first experiments, he discovered that in reality, an atom is mostly empty space. He found out that all the positive charges are not quite distributed everywhere in the atom. Actually, they are concentrated at the center of the atom. Kind of like a cell would have a nucleus, atoms also have nucleus. So this is his discovery that the positively charged particles are actually concentrated in the center. And the negatively ones, negatively charged ones, are kind of just surrounding it. So this is this model. Notice the difference between this one and this one. This one I drew like an outer line, kind of implying that this one's solid lump. Here, I removed that because Rutherford discovered that actually atoms are mostly empty space. Just a bunch of negatively charged particles surrounding a bunch of positively charged ones. 
We also refer to this part here as a nucleus. Except it's not the nucleus we find itself. This is the atom's version of a nucleus. So you find the positive charge. Many years later, everywhere I compete with Mr. Aman. Does Mr. Aman teach you? Then when it came to Bohr's model, Bohr's experiments, he realized that these negatively charged particles don't just float around aimlessly. They kind to him, in his model, he found that the negatively charged particles kind of orbit around fixed zones. Here, I'm drawing two zones dotted lines. You find some of these negatively charged particles orbiting one zone, then some orbiting another zone. So here I'm drawing two of them orbiting this zone. And maybe I'll just draw that one up here orbiting <coughs> the second zone. So that was Bohr's model. He realized that these negatively charged particles, they occupy certain zones. And this theory was that it orbits kind of like planets around the sun. But as you can see in your textbook, if you go to present day, you find that this model doesn't even hold up anymore. In modern day, we have enough technology to prove that this is not the case. These negatively charged particles don't orbit the nucleus like planets around the sun. They don't. Instead, they exist instead like a cloud. Like clouds in the sky, or maybe a swarm of bees or house flies surrounding a, a food. Yeah, this modern day. Modern day scientists, we found out that electrons, sorry I said the word, negatively charged particles kind of just exist as clouds around the nucleus. And so I can't really draw the last model. It's a rather hard to draw. I can still draw the nucleus, but as for the negatively charged particles, they kind of exist as a cloud. You can find these negatively charged particles within this cloud. Sometimes here, sometimes there, but within a cloud not so much spinning around like planets. I'd like to, before we end off today, introduce the names of all these particles I've been referring to so often, because it's a mouthful to say all these words. Number one, all these positively charged particles, we refer to them as protons. You can find this on page 45 of your textbook as well. Proton, singular. Protons, plural. So protons. Next, the negatively charged ones we refer to as electron. So electron for singular, electrons, plural. There's one more category of subatomic particles. So I'm using another word not right now called subatomic. Subatomic means smaller than atom. Uh, these are all examples of subatomic particles. Scientists along the way also discovered a third category of subatomic particles. Particles that do not have charge at all. So I'm drawing three more over here. I did not put a plus or minus, there's no charge. This last category of particles is called neutron. Because it stems from the word neutral. No charge. Protons. Okay, actually protons. P for positive, I guess. Okay, with the S is the plural form of it. So three categories of subatomic particles I'd like you to be aware of. 
and in our next lesson onwards, we will start to learn how to arrange all these subatomic particles within an atom.